We're going to roll our D20s and go on this journey. <laughs> Got it. We're rolling our D20s. That is gender euphoria. Yes. Yep. I'm Jasper Lior, and this is Gender Euphoria, the podcast where we break down what gender euphoria is and talk about the beautiful, wonderful, incredible parts of trans identity. Today, I'm with Shay Roberts Gillen. Shay is a nourisher of humans, enjoyer of art making, and all around here for the fun times. Thank you so much for being here, Shay. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I'm so glad we're friends now. Hell yeah, we are. Me too. Yes. Shay, what does gender euphoria mean to you? Oh boy. Well, it's a shifting definition. So today in the here and now, it feels like, ah, uh, it feels like all of the bits of me reaching into all of the bits of ever and feeling big and huge about it and joyful and explosive with that joy and that pleasure. And then also like containing a little piece of that and putting it in a little box in my heart in case I need it for the dark times. I haven't heard that yet. Keeping it. That's yeah, important. I, th I think, you know, we're humans and as much as the, the good times feel good and they're all, you know, we want all that all the time, like humanness and the world has light to it and it has dark to it and it's important to find the ways to hold on to the light when the dark times come around and sometimes that's like you do it for yourself and sometimes you can't do it for yourself and that's what friends and community are for and so like yeah keeping a little bit of that for me or maybe keeping it for someone else I love that thinking about it as like a tangible thing like an energy yeah. that can be shared and, you know, stored somewhere else for later. Yeah. Yeah, like you're a little candle maker of joy and euphoria. Oh, are your little candles <laughs> your little euphoria candles? Maybe they are now. <laughs> I don't make candles, but I gotta start now. We'll add it to your, to your bio. To my bio. Candle maker. <gasps> and then I can be in a rhyme. We can put you in a rhyme. If yeah. all you wants to be in a rhyme, we can, we can do that. That would be, oh, if only those were all of the needs that I had in the world. <laughs> Need yeah. met. Done. Is there a physical sensation that you have around gender euphoria? Mm, it's pretty warm feeling usually. So warmer months are great for me. That doesn't necessarily mean hotness, though. Or like warm, like... But like the cold months also come with their own special kinds of warmths, you know, like the, the warmth of a fire or like a hug when we finally get to hug people more <laughs> or like feeding each, like making a meal with friends. Like it feels good in my core, in my torso. And how do you differentiate, if you do, between just like the general euphoria you get from existing sometimes and specifically the gender euphoria? Mmm. Great. Good question. I think, oh boy, you know, I've been thinking about this since we talked before and I haven't got an answer for you yet. How do I differentiate? I don't know, because I think the lines get blurred a whole lot because I, where I'm at in my own journey of discovering all of the cool and amazing parts of myself are really intersected. The things that make the most sense for like the little signposts along the way that Shay, you do not exist in a binary. Like, those are all intrinsically missed in the things that bring me great joy. So, like, the ability to be like so many options exists on the improv stage. And the, like, like, I like can't even breathe. It's in my chest. It's like I get a breathlessness. Birth for me was really probably like one of the most foundational moments in where I'm at right now in my identity and like was incredibly euphoric because I turned into the whole universe and the universe not on a binary the universe is literally everywhere and so there's like an expansion in my chest that feels like that euphoria there's there's a there, there's also one in my mind that goes on at the same time that just exudes that 
that energy that I can lock away for later, except for I don't want to lock it away because I want to share it. But like I can keep a little piece of that or I can tap into those memories of when I had that just to feel a little bit of that expansion. Did I answer your question? I get lost on tangents. No, I love that. I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I'm so interested Great. to hear more about your birthing experience because I don't feel like euphoria yeah. is generally a word you hear surrounding that. No. I think you're right. And gender also, like. Yeah, so um, I don't know if you know, but people like to really prescribe childbirth to something that is sacredly feminine. And that is a great thing for people who want to feel that way about it. But it's not great for me. Um, I was starting to use they and she pronouns when I was pregnant with my first child. in closer quarters and it felt really really great in those closer quarters when people would default to the they but like we were we my my partner and I we were really sure that we wanted to do our best not to like inflict the binary on our children and so like did as much as we could to like bubble any of the like baby's parts and identity from the world while we were pregnant we didn't find out anything about what kind of genitals our kid had because we were like we don't we don't know who this child is until this child tells us and so that also translated in pregnancy looking a lot like finding out I do not like to be called mom Um, I always knew I wanted to become a parent and so doing that was really powerful I had with my first pregnancy I didn't get super bad morning sickness beyond like kind of the first trimester and then felt really great for most of the rest of my pregnancy until the last two weeks I had some ligament issues that were really painful but then birth itself hit I went hard into labor with no early labor it was just my water broke and I was in labor and it was like Sometimes it feels traumatic that I didn't get any of that intro to labor (laughs) and other times it feels really nice because I didn't have to get into my own way with it. I was just like, I went straight there and because I didn't have any early or lighter contractions, my brain just went to coping how it did. This is the part of the podcast where mom, if you're listening and you don't want to know things about my sex life, you should just jump ahead a half a minute. Uh... (laughs) or anybody else who might be related to me and doesn't want to know. But like, so contraction started and all of the tools that I learned as a bottom in the kink community just like came into play of like, oh, I'm just going to manage this and I'm going to get to the next bit. And so mom, it's safe again. Um, (laughs) uh, So like that, it just, it went from zero to on And then we got to the pushing part of labor, and this all happened in three and a half hours. So about three hours into this wildly strong labor, and I was like fully dilated, and so it was like, okay, you can get into the water as soon as the doctor gets here, because rules and policies, and that's a different podcast. And I got in the water, and when the doctor arrived and like got to start pushing, and it was like the most incredible feeling in the world, because I was... 100% only myself, and that per- (laughs) Hello emotions, that person- I'm gonna say nice things about myself and I'm getting a little weepy about it, which is also another podcast. Uh, Like I was powerful and sexy and beautiful and like this whole human (laughs) grew inside of me and was coming out. And I don't know how you do that without becoming the universe. So I became the universe. And I think- once you expand in that way and because of all of like the management tools I got to just like revel in being myself and I liked it it felt so good and then I had a baby to hold (laughs) wow I was not gonna cry today but I guess I was and that's great yeah it was really nice you're making me emotional also that is so beautiful and epic and we need to get you your own podcast would you say that that moment was made was like one of the f- first times you really were conscious of feeling 100 percent yourself outside of this binary like 
I think something I've noticed talking to people is that there maybe is a moment on people's gender journeys or a few moments at the beginning where you are first discovering yourself and you're first having these feelings of being completely yourself. And I'm wondering if yeah. that moment for you was one of those moments. I don't think it was the first moment because my whole life it was like, oh, you're such a tomboy. And then other times it'd be like, oh, you're so, you're so girly and feminine, you know, like... It was like both of these feel good to me uh, and all the places in between. Like I would, I at one point in my life was like, what if we did a photo series in prom dresses, like cutting down this tree that needs to come out of our yard that's dying? You know, like it's always been fun to like mix that up and fuck with it. Or like I was at a, a cousin's wedding and like, the things that I wanted to do at the after party were the things that like all of my uncles wanted to do. And like, you know, cigars and scotch and like having opinions about them. My dad was like, you are not a chick. And I was like, oh, you know, so there have been these little like signposts along the way. But this is the moment that it was fully like, I don't know, this is the moment that it became like physicalized in a really, really intense and gorgeous way. Yeah. Would you say it's a moment that like you can't ever return to where you were before you become the universe, really? Yeah, you become the universe and you can't ever not have been that at that point then. The, e even if I can never expand to that point again, which I never, I didn't become the universe with my second when we got to pushing, which I was a little, like, I was really excited to do and then it didn't happen. But then like that birth was very rooted and like had its own cool sensations. But like, I don't, I don't, the potential and all of, all of that expansion is still there. I just might not reach out that far ever again because it was also really intense. It was a lot of work to get there. Yeah. So who knows? I'll let you know if it happens again. It'd be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there's so many intersections that you exist in. And I'm yeah. so curious to know, like, as a birth worker, as a genderqueer human coming into this practice of helping people give birth and then you know having these baby humans that you've just delivered into the world like there's so many intersections of gender and gender euphoria and gender dysphoria and all those things and yeah if you I mean that's pretty vague not really a question but <laughs> yeah it's it's a really it's a really fun and beautiful place to be and it can be a really hard place to be um, supporting queer clients is far more euphoric than su supporting non-queer clients because queer clients come with a shared experience. They're, there's just like, I don't know, there's just, when you're in community, it feels different. Or like, I've supported close friends who are not queer and that came with its own shared sense of like f of community but like when I'm supporting somebody in a hospital setting where there's like changeover of staff and hospitals are just not as far along on their journey of degendering birth and degendering who supports people in birth like it is never on my clients shoulders to make sure that I'm not misgendered because they're they're busy birthing a baby so there's an interesting intersection there of like showing up for a space or in a space for someone else while also making sure I don't walk away with my own things and I it's complicated and I'm a white person doing this work um, so for anybody of color any black queer doula doing this work there's like even more layers of navigating that but also it's, I think, a lot, like, my own euphoric experience in birth is a lot of what brought me here. I know a lot of people who do the same work do the work because they had a bad experience, and I think both of those things are really valid. But, yeah, it's a lot of people-centering. Um, it was a vague question, and you got a windy answer. <laughs> you just made me have a thought that, like... A lot of trans humans are born out of these big moments of either euphoria or dysphoria, generally. Yeah. Like, they're born out of their entire life experience, but the realization comes in these big moments. And birth is this huge moment of creating a brand new human out of a moment of extreme emotion. And that yeah. is just, like, a very cool parallel that 
exists there. Yeah, yeah, and I think any way that you come to pregnancy and birth comes with a lot of emotion. You know, I think a lot of the narrative for birth, well, I think, I know, we see it, is is dominated by, like, pretty straightforward cis hetero penis and vagina sex and the baby comes out like there's this whole like how do we how do we initiate labor get the baby out the same way you got it it in but that's not you know penis and vagina sex is not how every baby got conceived but the I think that emotional thing piece that you just named is like the the piece that's really important to that is like it is it is emotional it is transformation it is changing dynamics it's changing like when you become a parent you change how you move in the world which is similar or not because like so many trans and non-binary folks that I know like they're like this is actually who I've always been I just found better words for myself or better ways to understand myself <sighs> uh is there a moment of gender euphoria maybe besides the birth story you already told that stands out in your life? Oh, gosh. Anytime I get to fully be myself and not be a little bit guarded about who I am in, in what space is amazing. But the, the moments that it's, like, extra amazing is in those times when I'm moving in a space where I feel like I have to have armor on and somebody does or says something that lets me take a piece of that armor off. So, like at a family gathering where not everybody gets it or is in the same wavelength and like someone else steps up to wear a piece of the armor for me or finding community where the armor isn't like finding yourself accidentally in community where you don't need the armor and everyone just throws it all in the ocean but like in a non-littering way let's not litter yeah we can like litter those, our metaphysical the times. cis hat armor yes. in the ocean but Yes. No real garbage. Yes. No real garbage. Yeah. Those moments you're when you you're right when you are so guarded and then someone does something that just takes a piece away. It's so relieving yeah. and just like your whole chest opens up. I feel my gender euphoria a lot in my chest, which is kind of funny because yeah. I want to cut my boobs off. But I'm sure it's yeah. all connected. <laughs> I yeah, I have that's a thing. I'm like so this chest of mine nourishes my little humans, my little my little goblins, and I'm both grateful for it and I want it to be gone, but I want it to be gone because I'm so sick of it being touched, not because I feel like I want top surgery for for like how I want my body to look for me in the way that I see myself if I were to draw myself on paper. That's a good exercise. Like, this, the, the person I see in my head when I look at myself looks pretty much the same. But I also am sick of my goblins touching my chest. <laughs> yeah. And if it was gone, they couldn't touch it. They would just touch me somewhere else that I would want to chop off. <laughs> anyway, that's different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I probably, I was breastfed till I was like four and a half. So for a long time. <gasps> Do you have time. memories of it? Oh, yeah. Do you have and my mom, That's amazing. like the pinnacle of her existence was breastfeeding me and my sister. And so when I went on, when I began this journey of like chest, boobs, yes, no, what do I want? Definitely a lot of breastfeeding things came up for me just in the fact that like my whole life I was told it was the most magical experience a person could go through. Yeah. And here I am like, I don't know that I, you know, I'm pretty confident I don't want to have my own biological children but like yeah. I'm not sure I don't want to like you know I don't know I'm very excited that that was your mom's magical experience but it's absolutely like not you I release you from the expectation that <laughs> that you have to have that thank you uh, you don't need me to release you from that but sometimes it's nice to have another person say I it. appreciate that I've, I've been working and, on it, and I'm pretty good. And I have this really yeah. beautiful visualization of whatever hypothetical ch child I have or don't have just, like, resting on my flat chest and, like, that <gasps> being a beautiful experience that we have. Yeah. There are so many amazing options for feeding children, both for people who can create milk and people who, who aren't able to. There are so many variations of what that looks like within 
like surgeries and and everything as well so like the the options are out there they're endless yeah um yeah <laughs> Why is gender euphoria important? I think we spend so much time as trans and non-binary folks being in the dark that we need those light and expansive moments. We deserve them. We need to keep talking about them. I think that's why this podcast is really important and delightful is like we like it has to like we have to keep sharing that we can exist 100% how we are and who we are and it feels good and so when it's shitty times I don't know maybe listen to an episode and be like okay somebody has had that the possibility in this universe exists for me to have that I'm going to stay the course I'm going to I'm going to find that that's going to be mine we're gonna roll our d20s and go on this journey <laughs> got it we're rolling our d20s that is gender euphoria yes Yep. I, yeah, and like, I, I'm feeling like why I think gender euphoria is important be is because I feel like transness is so important for this world. Yes. And yes. joy is so important for marginalized people and communities. And I was just doing like crazy journaling, rambling the other day and writing about joy and how I think joy is the opposite of capitalism <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> and like yes. how I yep. want to use that and... Yeah. So yeah. those are my little thoughts. Yep. Like when I think of like what is the dream, it is like living in community, like creating what brings joy to our heart. So for me that's like a lot of art and like food, growing that food together. Someone is in pain and showing up with what they need and like maybe this person's really great at this skill or like someone's going to have a baby and so like I'm going to go and support them and then we all come together and feed that person and support that family afterwards. Like that's the dream and that like there's it's community, it's it's existing outside of grind. It's yeah. I think that a lot of people will join you in that dream. And there's I think the reason, one of the many reasons why so many queer people have that same dream is because sh straight cis heteronormativity is so isolating by design. And when you are queer, you gain this entire family and you get to be amazing and like not isolated finally, but then you still have to live in your own houses and you have to be separate and you have to like still you're still confined to these boxes even though your soul and your spirit and your brain can see outside of that so then we're all like mm -hmm. well why don't we just all form a commune this is dumb right <laughs> like let's all leave the wilds of capitalism and go to yeah these these places and i think it's really interesting to think about how we exist in like families born out of like intentional family building through through like having children but then also the the family that we gain as we go through life and get older and sometimes the families we're born into are not the families where we thrive best um and i think about like what what can that look like in a way that doesn't feel like i'm leaving I'm like I look I think about my kids and I'm like hopefully they don't have trauma from our parenting we're working really hard to prevent that and to be intentional but when it's time for them to go and build their own families and find their own queer commune or whatever iteration of a commune they choose to inhabit like what is that going to be like and it it just like that kind of expansion feels like something I don't know how to imagine, but maybe it's just that I haven't spent a lot of time with it. I feel so excited thinking about that, but I love to imagine and just, you know, I love that. And I love thinking about these generations of children now who are being born into this world as it is and like how expanded they are just coming out like that. And I am so excited to see the world that they create. Yeah. You think it's one of the ways that my anxiety is both triggered and soothed is like, I cannot know who you're going to become, but I'm so excited to find out and go on that journey with you. Yes. What is seeing your gender today 
right now, these days. Hmm. It could just be because we're on the verge of everything sprouting up out of the ground, but I feel real connected to the cycle of the earth and that ability to like grow, explode, revel in itself and then die, let die what doesn't need to come back. Yep. <laughs> That's gender affirming for sure. <laughs> yeah. Or like the way like watercolor spreads through and like bleeds onto your paper and it just does things you weren't even expecting but shit that's cool yeah i love both of those visuals those work <laughs> i'm not gonna overthink it no that's great is there anywhere you want people to find you on the internet you're welcome to try and muddle through my existence on instagram at knitting a yarn and then if you need birth support, I do do virtual birth support with my amazing partner in that business, or we do in-person births here in the Twin Cities. Or if you want an in-person birth and you're not in the Twin Cities, you are super welcome to email me or contact me and I will connect you with some awesome queer birth workers because there are so many. And that business is called Nise Body and Birth. Very cool. Thank you so much, Shay. This was amazing. Yeah, this was really fun. Thank you. So excited to go roll D20s and be the universe and have so much joy. Yeah. 10 out of 10 recommend being the universe. We did it. Yay. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and follow for more conversations with folks from across the gender galaxy. Show notes and photos to go with each episode are on our Instagram, at Gender Euphoria Pod. If you or someone you know needs to talk to somebody about gender, visit thetrevorproject.org. If you or somebody you know wants to talk to me about gender on this podcast, email info at queervideography.com. Gender Euphoria is produced on Massachusetts, Pawtucket, and Namkeag land. More information about the Massachusetts tribe can be found at massachusettribe.org. Gender Euphoria is a queer videography podcast, produced by Alana Capra and Jack Hallowell. Music by Jasper Lior. Love yourself, listen to your body, and gender boldly. Apple trees and honeybees, the ocean breeze, a really good sneeze. There's gender queer and gender fuck, non binary and ladies who tuck. There's trans man, thank you, ma'am. The girls, the gays, the days going out for a swim in a sea of manta rays. We're all eating to poop and pooping to eat in whatever bathroom I take a seat. And we're all just humans, homos looking for love. We're all just humans, except the cats and aliens. <laughs>